cover the business cases as well as the tech for VDI. Before we get started, however, I wanted to define uh, desktop virtualization. Much like cloud computing, there are many different definitions. Uh, in my opinion, the one offered by Wikipedia uh, was fairly accurate, and so I've included it here on this slide. As we all know, desktop virtualization is nothing new. Citrix, Microsoft, and VMware all make virtualization software solutions that centralize the support and maintenance of end-user desktops. Below are just some of the benefits. We all know about anytime, anywhere access. We all understand and appreciate the need to have an optimal user experience. Uh, the obvious benefit of centralized management. Using a VDI solution makes it vastly easier to manage security and compliance regulations. And then, of course, the obvious business continuity and disaster recovery benefits, which we call BCDR. Okay. So we have uh, before you, VDI, a brief history. In 1989, Citrix WinFrame 1.6 was released. As many of you remember, it ran on a multi-user version of NT351. So Citrix quickly released MetaFrame 1.8 for NT4.0, Terminal Server Edition. This was really groundbreaking in 1997 when we deployed it in the student labs at Georgetown University. The idea of being able to deploy a hosted shared desktop or a published application was really powerful. By 1998, a small startup was formed in Palo Alto, California. VMware was founded on the notion that we had a ton of servers scattered around the enterprise that were barely breaking a sweat. You had a server for this website and for that application or this file server or print server or whatever. As many of you remember, if you launched Procmon on any one of them during the day, maybe you saw 1% CPU utilization or network utilization. With VMware, I could buy one GSX or ESX host, virtualize all of those underutilized servers and place them in one centrally managed location. So the idea behind VMware was born. By 2000, we were in the throes of Y2K. Every machine and just about every piece of code built or developed in the last 30 years required some level of management. It was a painstakingly manual process that would have been vastly easier to tackle in a virtualized world. Then came 9-11. Then came the anthrax square, a scare a few weeks later. Uh, these events are important because they brought into focus the need for virtual desktops. Uh, I was in D.C. at the time, and as I was telling members of our team back in McLean, you know, people were afraid to drive downtown. And in some instances, employees were told to, to stay home or report to a satellite facility in the suburbs. And I remember at the time, Citrix's slogan was, work isn't a place, it's something you do. And uh, I think this really resonated with companies and agencies who quickly adopted virtual desktops. So fast forward to 2002 and Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, we all remember this legislation was all about data. Who had it, where it was stored, and how it was secured. You know, this idea that a DOD laptop with 150,000 social security numbers left in the backseat of a taxi could impact your IT strategy was very real. And it began to sink in very quickly that centrally managed uh, secure remote virtual desktops were the future, which is why in 2004, EMC, a storage company, uh, acquired VMware. By now, the concept of virtualization was really taking hold. Almost everyone wanted to virtualize their existing server infrastructure, which is why three short years later, EMC sold a 15% stake of the company in an initial public offering. So by 2007, 2008, almost all Fortune 500 companies owned some flavor or piece of the VDI puzzle. So whether it was Citrix Presentation Server, what is today ZenApp, VMware vSphere for server virtualization, and Microsoft Server for, for the underlying OS. So Citrix owned the virtual desktop until VMware released Vue 3.0 in 2008. This was a big moment. Now, VMware could compete with Citrix on the desktop piece, and because VMware already owned the hypervisor, it was now poised to steal market share from Citrix. To compete with VMware from a hypervisor perspective, Citrix acquired ZenSource in 2007. 
this strategic move put them on, I'll say, somewhat equal footing uh, with VMware. Although the vast majority of Citrix customers use VMware or Microsoft as their hypervisor, just as an FYI. So in 2009, the internet was buzzing with the death of the PC. Everywhere you look, someone was telling you about or writing about the death of the PC and the advent of cloud computing. Everyone from IBM to Yahoo to Amazon, 3PAR and Rackspace were getting in on the act. It was going to be a $160 billion industry. It's no coincidence that in late 2009, Citrix released its VDI offerings and Desktop 4, and the VDI arms race ensued. View 4 was released, followed by View 5. Citrix then released Zen Desktop 5, then Zen Desktop 6, and then Zen Desktop 7. So from 1998 to 2006, Citrix dominated the virtual desktop landscape, even though most Citrix customers were running on VMware vSphere. And by 2010, both sides were trying to steal market share from the other in their respective areas. Citrix wanted more of the hypervisor market with Zen Server, and VMware was all too keen to take desktop virtualization share away from Citrix. You can see by 2015, they are almost dead even, with a slight edge going to Citrix for desktop virtualization. One side note, if you take a closer look at the major player section, you can see there's been some consolidation in the market. For example, Caviza was acquired by Citrix. They had the uh, uh, smaller SME, SMB solution for VDI in a box. And Quest and their vWorkspace product is now called Wise vWorkspace 8.5. I would also mention that in this chart, the uh, Unidesk is in the contenders field. I would actually place them in the major players category. What will VDI adoption look like in two years? Well, we know it will look a lot different from today and include solutions from disruptors like Nutanix, Unidesk, KVM, as well as traditional vendors like Dell, Microsoft, VMware, and Citrix. Okay, I promised you a poll earlier and I'm getting the sign from Gordon that he's ready. So on your screens, you will see a window with a blue background containing a multiple choice question. Uh, use your mouse to click on your response and I'll throw it back to Gordon to tell us more. All right, thanks, Sean. So I'm going to launch the first poll, and it's multiple choice. You should see it right now. So the question is, my organization has evaluated or deployed some flavor of VDI, yes, no. So I'll leave this up here for a moment for everybody to answer. All right, thank you, everybody. And next question. The question is, what virtual desktop solution do you currently use? VMware Horizon View, Microsoft RDS, Citrix Zen Desktop, or none of these? All right, thanks everyone. Last question here. What brand of hypervisor do you currently <coughs> use? VMware vSphere ESX, Microsoft Hyper-V, Citrix Zen Server, or none of these?
All right, I think everybody's answered at this point. I'll go ahead and close this. All right, Sean, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Great. Uh, thank you. That was a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, everyone enjoyed that. We don't typically do polling inside of our webinars, but we wanted to leverage that feature uh, today so we could get some feedback from our, from our clients and customers. So thank you for that. Uh, as we discussed earlier, some of you are still in the early stages of understanding and defining your requirements. Some of you be have begun to assess your current operational state and compare that with your goals and your objectives. You're asking yourself, what do we already own? You know, what can we leverage? Some of you have deployed VDI and perhaps haven't gotten the return on investment you expected. And some of you have successfully deployed some flavor of VDI and uh, are the toast of the town. No doubt those folks worked with our great infrastructure virtualization practice here at DICES. Okay, so without further delay, let's jump into the top 10 reasons VDI projects fail or are abandoned. Number 10, not calculating network impact. So many organizations still rely on these old bandwidth assumptions. Uh, a single Citrix or, or terminal server session could use between 20 and 50 kbps per session. Virtual desktops, however, provide a richer experience that may include flash, video, social media, and other peripherals. Uh, VDI users experience less idle time than published app or published desktop users. Therefore, it's important to take into account the additional load on the network. Estimating network impact should be a key consideration. And, and one quick tech note uh, for all you VMware View users out there, PC over IP, the protocol developed by Teradici and used by View, uses approximately two to three times the bandwidth as Citrix ICA HDX. So just keep that in mind when you're uh, architecting your solution. Number nine. No user profile strategy. One of the ways a pooled virtual desktop becomes personalized is through the user profile. If your end users are going to embrace a new desktop strategy, they must have the ability to personalize the desktop. The method used, whether it's Unidesk, Profile Manager, AppSense, what have you, should complement the environment and must not significantly interfere with performance. And one quick tech note. Uh, understand your users and their needs. Don't, don't just pilot this uh, VDI solution in IT. I think it's really important to select users from different departments so you can get different perspectives. You know, for, for example, an ER nurse may not care about desktop personalization, but a user in finance or HR might. Number eight, no app virtualization strategy. Well, what does this mean? A proper app virtualization strategy should determine two things. Number one, what is the appropriate number of desktop images and how many is too many? For example, if you have an image for IT, HR, sales, finance, marketing, you're probably defeating the purpose of VDI and reducing your return on investment. The second item for consideration is you have to ask yourself, are traditional desktops still required? Even today, uh, many firms that we work with use a stripped down bare bones OS image on a traditional PC. Uh, if the user needs a particular app, they can select that app a la carte and have it delivered to their desktop. You know, one important thing to remember here is the 80-20 rule. We hear this a lot in IT. The thing with VDI is we seldom see any deployments where there's 100% adoption across the board. So keep that in mind. Number seven. Poor resource allocation. Uh, I know it seems fairly obvious to discuss vCPU and VRAM allocation, but you'd be amazed at how many firms are trying to do VDI on some sort of shoestring budget with existing or older equipment. You know, uh, as engineers, we think having so many sessions or so many users per server, per host, or CPU is, is really radical. Uh, but I can assure you the users don't see it that way, which is why every effort should be made to provide not just adequate, uh, allocation, but allocation that will wow and impress. Uh, remember, we, we hear about this all the time, the battle of the desktop. Well, in this battle over the desktop, the users hold the majority of the cards. If they don't like or they view this as a downgrade, your project will almost certainly fail. Number six, improperly tuned antivirus. You hear about this all the time. Uh, you can Google antivirus in VDI and get a ton of hits. 
Uh, simply adding an AV solution to your VDI platform can have a major impact on virtualization infrastructure and even cause users to experience you know, poor desktop performance. So for example, if the virtual desktops are streamed with something like PBS or Wise Streaming Manager, uh, those desktops start a full scan at roughly the same time. And those virtual desktops will eventually request the entire VDisk image. And this will not only overwhelm the network and PBS, but it will also impact your storage infrastructure as the right cache is utilized. Number five. Poor bootstorm management. Most users arrive to the office and they log into their desktops at roughly the same time. And yet we're still using the default out of the box settings on our broker servers, i.e. we have two workstations spun up and ready to go. The problem, we have 250 users trying to log in simultaneously. So spinning up a virtual desktop has the single largest impact to any VDI deployment. The controller has to tell the hypervisor to start a new desktop and the hypervisor must allocate resources. Too many requests can overwhelm the hypervisor's management layer. This applies to everyone, ESX, Hyper-V, and Zen server. Of course, this can be mitigated by configuring the maximum number of simultaneous startups the controller can request. Number four, virtual desktop optimization. So I remember attending a VMware conference several years ago. They, they touted the ease with which an administrator could create, configure, and deploy a virtual desktop. Citrix responded a year later with 10 minutes to Zen, uh, this idea that a, an administrator could create, configure, and deploy virtual desktops in Citrix. The note here is that you know any vanilla product installation in the lab or test tube is easy and straightforward. But then you add users and their different work styles, whether those are task workers, knowledge workers, power users, mobile users, executives. Then you add a dozen different endpoints, including desktops, laptops, thin clients, tablets, and yes, smartphones. And then on top of that, you add 350 line of business applications used by your employees, and you see my point. Applications and operating systems have come a long way since 2000, 2003, but there's still room for optimization when it comes to host architecture, server configuration, application, and network tuning. Number three, insufficient cache or memory. So this kind of falls under the same category as number seven. Uh, too often administrators limit the initial amount of virtual RAM to 1024 megabytes. They've used their VDI calculators to arrive at this figure and based on the desired number of users per host. And this is what they buy. The problem is everyone isn't a task worker. So this Goldilocks number for VRAM no longer applies. This is why it's absolutely key to understand your users and their work styles and to adjust accordingly. And I'm not just telling you to throw more RAM at the problem. The, the system must be configured and tuned appropriately. So for those of you who recently made the jump to server 2008 R2 or server 2012, you're already benefiting from the enhancements in the memory allocation system. Number two, poor controller configuration. So this is an often overlooked issue. Most VDI platforms, Zen Desktop, Horizon View, RDS, they can function with a single controller. However, uh, during boot and logon storms where hundreds of users connect to the environment at once, the controller, which is like the traffic cop for the environment, can and does become a bottleneck. So this is why from a design perspective, Citrix, VMware, and Microsoft recommend dividing controller functionality across multiple servers. So for environments that host more than a thousand virtual desktop, uh, desktops, let's say, Citrix recommends separating the roles across five servers, all virtualized, of course. A dedicated or master controller, two XML controllers, and two storefront, or for you legacy users out there, web interface servers. This accomplishes two things. One, by spreading the load across multiple servers, you increase your capacity, and two, you achieve some built-in fault tolerance and redundancy. And the number one reason VDI projects fail or are abandoned, improper storage design. The issue, IOPS, IOPS, IOPS. One size does not fit all. What does IOPS stand for, you ask? Input, output, operations per second. 
Okay, so it's not all about IOPS, but it's a major player in your VDI rollout. Virtual desktops rely on the storage array to load different parts of the OS and user environment. Each request impacts the storage environment. So without a properly designed storage subsystem, a user's virtual desktop will slow to a crawl. In order to properly design the storage infrastructure, your architect must take the following into account. Number one, disk speed. Number two, read-write percentage and ratios. Number three, RAID level. And number four, desktop lifecycle. So by taking those four parameters into account, you can more accurately calculate the IOPS on a server-by-server -server basis. Okay, so where do we go from here? You know, we always share with our clients that before you know where you're going, you have to know where you are. And uh, that begins, in my humble opinion, with understanding three things. Number one, what are the business requirements driving this initiative? Number two, what do I currently own? Do I own VMware, the hypervisor, in which case it makes it easy to just upgrade to view? Or do I already own Citrix licenses? Maybe I own Platinum licenses and, I, and I'd like to upgrade. So what do I already have in my, in my product portfolio? And then the third question is, do I have the right personnel to support and manage it? You know, if, if I'm a VMware shop and I don't know, own any Citrix or Dell Quest or Kaviza or KVM or any of the other technologies, then it may not be a good idea to actually adopt something, you know, where I don't have, uh, you know, the appropriate technical people. So, you know, these are all important things to consider. And again, we see the project lifecycle slash, you know, methodology slide again. You know, these are not six-month initiatives. You know, VDI is a very involved uh, CapEx intense uh, project. And depending on the size and scope of your operation, coupled with the number of applications, the number of endpoints, and the number of users, um, you know, this could ostensibly be a, a multi-year project. So what are the keys to success? Well, first and foremost, you have to expand your view. You know, understand the dynamic and dependent relationships between configuration, performance, capacity, and applications. Number two, you have to learn how to deal with new problems. You know, it's inevitable that virtualization will add new concepts to learn, which can affect your updated environment in unexpected ways. Number three, I recommend getting educated and becoming certified. We talked about this before. It's this kind of people process product idea. And if your people are your, you know, your strongest asset, then we need to make sure they're ramped up on, on VDI and virtualization in general. So in 2015, getting educated is easy, and there are so many ways to do it, books, blogs, Twitter, uh, really cool webinars like the one you're on, videos, etc. cetera. Uh, number four, find new management tools. Uh, newer, updated tools will understand both the virtualization layer and the OS layer and provide greater management flexibility. Number five, experiment with the cloud. You know, as with most new technology, you want to walk before you run. So start slow, be methodical, and educate yourself on new concepts, new technologies, and new management systems that are available. And again, you know, don't just pilot this in IT. And whatever you do, don't pilot, pilot this in the, in the C-suite. You know, if the CFO is one of your champions and you used a virtual desktop in the past, then perhaps that individual might make a good test user or, or uh, early adopter. You know, but I don't recommend rolling out virtual desktops to high-level executives until you've completely tested and vetted the environment. Um, you know, giving a half-baked VDI solution to the CEO will only derail or, or worse to fund your project. And as I stated in reason number nine, you know, let's select users from different departments with different user profiles. We mentioned those task workers, knowledge workers, power users, mobile users, etc. Let's get different perspectives other than just IT. And finally, you know, many organizations pursue VDI because it's en vogue or in style. Make sure you're pursuing a VDI solution uh, because there's a sound business case for it. And tip number six, work with a trusted partner, you know, who has the right experience and a solid track record. VDI design and deployment requires a unique skill set. So working with a qualified team of experts will dramatically improve your success rate. So speaking of working with a trusted uh, partner, 
For those of you who are new to DISIS, we are a global firm founded in 1994. Our infrastructure practice was, was formed in 2009 and is an integral part of our managed services portfolio. So within the ISS practice, we have several core competencies including data center, virtualization, BCDR or business continuity disaster recovery, security and storage, as well as platform and client services. So from a delivery perspective, the ISS practice management team works with our great team of engineers and architects, as well as our first class project management team. So together, this assemblage of talent works shoulder to shoulder with our clients to educate them on emerging technologies in the ever-changing IT landscape. What we try to do is create a dialogue with our clients that increases awareness and mitigates risk while operating within a budgetary framework. So our consultants, engineers, developers, and architects work with our clients to develop technology strategies and solutions that are agile and flexible. I know we have a few more announcements from, from Gordon and then uh, we're excited to get to your questions. I, I do hope you enjoyed today's webinar and, and you were able to take something useful away from it. So Gordon, I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, just a few quick reminders before we get to the Q&A portion. If you have any additional questions from today's webinar that you might think of later or simply want to learn more about BDI and how to successfully roll it out, um, we hope that you will contact us and um, stay connected with us. We also encourage you to join us for our next educational webinar in our series, which will be focusing on mobile application development, the full life cycle. And that is going to be live in September. So as a reminder, if you do have any questions right now for Sean, um, please utilize your questions box um, from your GoToWebinar panel. Okay, Sean, so first question for you. Shoot. My CIO wants to use a virtual desktop on his iPad. We have not rolled out a VDI yet, so which solution is better equipped to complement our BYOD policy, Citrix or VMware? Well, so that's a good question, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, you know, understanding your requirements, you know, understanding what you already own, and understanding the people that you have uh, to support that environment. Um, you know, as you know, uh, from a bring your own device perspective, uh, Citrix kind of saw the writing on the wall back in 2011, 2012, and they acquired a mobility firm in California called uh, Zenprize. They then parlayed that product into their own portfolio, and now it's called uh, Zen Mobile, and that's their MDM solution. Uh, VMware, as they so often do, uh, responded in kind, and they actually acquired uh, AirWatch, I think, a year and a half or two years ago. And so, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, again, the, that prism that we defined earlier and kind of what's, what's the best technology based on those, those requirements. I think the Citrix solution is probably a little bit more mature. I think they've had more time to incorporate it in, into their service offering. And, and so, you know, if you own that, I, I, might, <clears throat> I might tend to steer you in that direction. But again, if you're a VMware shop and you're using Vue, then you already own, uh, you know, by virtue of your, your, uh, your EULA, your agreement with VMware, you might already own those licenses for AirWatch. So that, that's something, um, you know, to look into. All right, thanks, Sean. Next question. Uh, we are still using terminal services on server 2003 with Dell Quest V Workspace. We're using the Hyper-V. What is the most appropriate upgrade path? Well, if you participated in our, um, our last webinar, you know that 2003 is end of life, and there's, there's no safe haven for it. So there's no support, there's no patching, there's, there's nothing really. And so you, you really have no choice but to um, consider a net new upgrade. Uh, you're going to go to 2008 R2 or 2012. And as far as you know, that particular VDI solution that you have, I think I mentioned that in, in the material. Um, the Quest product is actually now part of the Dell Wise Quest offering, and there is a new version 
available. So I, I would check with your, uh, you know, I would check with the vendor on that or, you know, give us a call. We can certainly help you navigate those steps. But, you know, there is, there is an upgrade path. Unfortunately, it, it's not going to allow you to uh, use existing infrastructure. You're really going to be looking at net new infrastructure. I hope that answers your question. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, I'm currently not seeing any other additional questions other than will this presentation be available for download? And as a reminder, yes, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And we will also follow up with all attendees with the webinar slide deck and recording. Uh, actually, Sean, one more question for you here. Could you please expand on your statement about Teradici overhead? Right. So um, Teradici, they built the protocol PC over IP, which is used by VIEW. So when we talk about, you know, uh, protocols, you know, TCP IP with Microsoft, ICA with Citrix, PC over IP with, uh, with VIEW, what I'm, what I'm recommending is that you just factor that into your, your design and your architecture and make sure that you don't overlook the network component when you're doing your, your VDI uh, design, you know, everyone kind of thinks it's a, you know, a three-legged stool, right? It's my storage, it's my platform, and it's it's my app slash endpoints, but it's really a four-legged stool. And the piece that people most often forget or overlook is is the network. And it's very well documented that PC over IP actually uses uh, two to three times more bandwidth than um, than ICA. So I hope that answers your question about PC over IP. Thanks, Sean. Um, any additional questions from anyone for Sean? Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything else here. Um, so we really hope that you did enjoy today's webinar. Um, Sean, do you have any uh, closing remarks for the attendees? Well, we really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of experience in this space. We have a great practice led by Lee Mix down in, uh, down in Texas. It's one of the finest I've worked with. And uh, if you ever have any questions, you know, we want to be your trusted advisor and trusted uh, partner. We can help you navigate uh, many of these decisions and, uh, you know, help you with the overall solution. So if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to get in touch with us. All right, thanks very much, Sean, and thank you for everybody for attending. Um, I will be following up with the slide deck and recording as mentioned earlier. So thanks again. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Signing off here.